Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Uh, it is always challenging to be on the post-lunch uh, panel and keep everybody awake, but we have a stellar brain power uh, to address uh, a really key uh, issue of why deglobalization is happening. The deterioration of this uh, environment that gave us so much uh, after the collapse of the Soviet Union um, is uh, quite unfortunate and costly for everybody. We have a stellar panel, and I'll read the names of speakers uh, in the order they will appear. Uh, Harold James is professor of history in, at Princeton. Um, followed by Massimiliano Castelli, Managing Director for UBS in Asset Management. Then uh, Erica Moray from uh, the Geneva Graduate Institute. And Gunther Dubel is going to wrap it up for us. So when I'm looking at what are we dealing with today in terms of the political and geoeconomic factors. I see first and foremost the rise of China as a peer competitor to the United States, even more so than Russian post-Soviet frustration. China objects to the Western-oriented US-led globalization uh, with U.S. as a leader. China is pursuing a well-articulated policy aimed at weakening the U.S.-led global system. And as a result, the supply chain breakdown is a consequence of the global system's polarization and great power competition. It's not the cause of it. Much is at stake. The man who left us last week, Henry Kissinger, understood what the alternative was. The alternative is the total war of all against all, the return to the Herbazian world, chaos and destruction. Kissinger saw the de destruction, saw that destruction and lost friends and relatives in World War II. He dedicated his life to diplomacy to avoid a global nuclear war. For duration of his life, he succeeded. I hope we will succeed as well. In this crumbling of the global order, a number of important powers, such as Turkey, India, Brazil, and others, are not fully invested in the post-1990s US-led globalization. Major Western economists still support the liberal world order that allowed globalization, but some, like France, are tempted by national, nationalist solutions. And <clears throat> as the global supply chain is being reconfigured, there are winners and losers. The winners include countries with unique resources, including rare earth elements, which we are publishing a report, me and a couple of co-authors are publishing a report with Atlantic Council. Um, I'm sorry, we're publishing the report with my institution, the International Tax and Investment Center, and the presentation is going to be at the Atlantic Council. And then another report on rare earths in Africa is going to be with the Atlantic Council. Uh, so those who produce rare earths, besides China, are the winners. Africa, Europe, Central Asia, including Kazakhstan. Uh, also countries with low labor costs, from Bangladesh to Indonesia, to Vietnam and Mexico. I was comparing the other day foreign investment and investment per capita uh, in Mexico because of its closeness to the U.S. and low labor costs, the, uh, in certain industries, the labor costs in China are higher than in Mexico, and per capita, the foreign investment in Mexico is higher than in China. Um, countries that can build and operate computer chip mega factories to diversify away from Taiwan. 
such as Germany and the US. Among the losers, first and foremost, is China, which will see diminishing foreign investment technology bans, slower growth, and brain drain. China's attempt to lock key technologies, including photovoltaic, quantum computing, and other advanced IT technologies, EVs, batteries, AI, and robotics will be countered. Mobilizing subsidies, intellectual property theft, and violation of IP, intellectual property, is what the Marxist Leninists would call a premature concentration and caused a pushback. Of course, I can talk for a long time about Russia's disruption of the global fertilizer and food uh, supply chains that resulted in much higher cost, costs of food and food inflation in Africa, but also in the West. Um, if you go to a supermarket in America, like I do, I think our bills probably 30% higher than three years ago. Um, the interim U.S. solution, while inelegant, is probably adequate. While proclaiming the importance of a liberal wor world order and defending it, the institutions that make it up, the United States also are creating alternative structures, re regional groupings, and partnerships like the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, the Quad, and the Trade and Technology Council. The United States has an advantage in building regional arrangements with trusted partners, given its shared values and extensive web of alliances. These groups are more exclusive than existing global mechanisms like WTO, but they're easier to manage. So the dilemma for Europe and China uh, with expanded sovereignty is the United States is continuing to lead its innovation of new technologies, and that creates a limit how much Europe and China can disconnect without falling behind. If you ask me, I'm afraid that Europe is indeed falling behind because of its administrative and economic regulatory system. So the question for China is, can the massive state investment increased economic espionage stop Chinese um, increasing lack of competitiveness when it, cut, when it comes to cutting edge technologies and whether uh, President Xi's economic policies that are distancing from the sort of market-oriented socialism a la Deng Xiaoping um, and more emphasis on state regulation. Can it be a solution or can it exacerbate the existing problems? I think it does. If you go back and look at the value of assets, uh, Xi Jinping's policies, and by the way, Putin's policies in Russia destroyed, I think both of the gentlemen may qualify for the CIA Agent of the Year Award. So, <clears throat> both the developments in China and Russia's invasion of Ukraine are prompting very serious rethinking of the value chain, global distribution supply chains, um, French shoring, home shoring, and all that comes with hundreds of billions, of, if not trillions of dollars worth of costs. With that, as I suggested, we're going to go to Professor James first for the Tour d'Horizon, and then followed by uh, Mr. Castelli and Ms. Moray. And then good. So th th thank you very much, uh, uh, Ariel, for the setting this panel in a great perspective. Uh, it's wonderful to be here. Uh, thank you, Mark. Uh, thank you, Ambassador Blix. Uh, really terrific to be in, in, in Vienna and to have this discussion. I, I think, honestly, that this is a very, very fast-moving area. And we had some discussion this morning already about I exactly this area. At the, at the moment, it looks as if everybody is running away from globalization. And uh, th there's... Uh, one person after another says the world is deglobalizing. Last year, Larry Fink had a big uh, story, the world is deglobalizing. Um, Janet Yellen had a friendshoring speech. Uh, but already this year, I think you can see some pushing back from that. And uh, so friendshoring uh, isn't anymore 
the buzzword of the day. Uh, instead, it's about uh, resilience um, and about de-risking. So it's a much more moderate version uh, than the, the, the extreme versions of last year. Uh, we're beginning to retreat uh, from extreme deglobalization. And as a historian, uh, I have to say, this makes me think of the 1970s. And again, this was something that we discussed this morning, um, uh, that the big supply shock in the 1970s, uh, the uh, oil shock after 1973, and then the second one after 1979, the first reaction to the oil shock was to say, we need to do everything ourselves. We need to do things uh, in, in independently. Um, so I lived in the UK. I started university in 1975, and I remember there was this big Buy British campaign, and everybody stuck Union Jacks on their, on their, uh, their jackets, and uh, uh, I'm buying British, and uh, a newspaper chain um, that was owned by Robert Maxwell um, distributed uh, T-shirts with the with the newspaper. Um, I'm proud to buy British. And then there was a kind of little embarrassment because they found that the T-shirts were made in Portugal. Um, <laughs> it was made in Portugal at the time. Um, uh, yeah, yes, I mean exactly. A few years later, it would be made in China. Um, so uh, you, you know, the world started to deglobalize in the middle of the 1970s, and uh, then it didn't, and it went in a different direction. And uh, you know, it w wasn't just the turn with Ronald Reagan and uh, Mrs. Thatcher; it was already with Jimmy Carter and James Callaghan in the UK that you, you started to see that you know this this course of going for what was called in Britain a siege economy was the big mantra of that period uh, wasn't really viable. Um, so I, I wanted, uh, as if I could set up a kind of introductory version of this, uh, this story, I wanted to think about the incredible proliferation of the term geopolitics. You know, what does geopolitics actually mean? Um, uh, it's, 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 it's really, I think, good to think of this because it seems to me there are two meanings of geopolitics and they've got blurred and confused with each other. Um, one is simply that geography matters in trade relations, and you know, people knew this for a long, long time. And uh, you know, for instance, uh, it's less likely that the UK is going to do a lot of trade with New Zealand uh, than it is that the UK is going to do trade with France and with Ireland. Uh, but this is not really a big surprise, and you know, I think it's, it's, it's obvious and a little bit banal. Um, uh, the second meaning of geopolitics is the one that I think uh, uh, Ariel was taking us into in the beginning of the, the session. Uh, that is that uh, the world is in a zero-sum game and that if one side loses, the other side gains and, uh, and vice versa. And so uh, you, 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 you can't anymore uh, get any benefit uh, from uh, trade. And that, I think, is the view that is... Um, is really destructive because once you start to go on that route, uh, you find it impossible then uh, to address any public goods issues, any uh, issues of the global commons. Uh, you know, for instance, I mean, even if it comes to climate change, you know, once you start to see the world in, geo -sum g in zero sum games in terms of geopolitics, uh, some countries will start to argue that climate change is really good for them. And for a long time, this was presented as a case uh, that the, for uh, the Russian Federation, for instance, um, global warming is good because it pushes the grain growing area further north. And so it, it offers more in the way of resources. They didn't think at that time about the thawing of the permafrost. Uh, so the, the, there are complicated things, but people will see every issue and then you can't solve them. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, that's one dangerous concept that uh, I would really think we better use it a bit more cautiously than we have been using it. Uh, second concept is decoupling. Um, decoupling, um, I, I think, originated in 2016. Um, uh, in 2016, uh, 2016 was the year of the Brexit referendum. 23rd of June, 
the year of the US presidential election that produced uh, the Trump presidency, the 8th of November. Uh, but decoupling was actually given to the world by uh, the decoupling of uh, Chris Martin from Coldplay and uh, Gwyneth Paltrow, who I believe is the person who originally came up with the idea of decoupling and really popularized it. She was doing conscious decoupling. And uh, so, you know, this is the idea then that we want to apply uh, when the marriage split up, uh, the uh, uh, Paltrow, uh, Chris Martin uh, marriage uh, s is split up. Um, so, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's fine uh, for a film star and a lead guitarist to do this, but it's not fine. Uh, for the United States and China to do that, and I think they're also seeing that that isn't the case. And uh, I think, you know, for the reasons that you suggested right in your introduction, uh, that China realizes now uh, that it's in the middle of a property bust, um, it's in the middle of a deflation, it's running out of steam technologically, the war on the tech giants was misconceived, um, it can't do without the connections, and it can't do... Uh, without the international connectedness. Um, so, uh, you know, that, I think, for me, was the meaning of the uh, Xi uh, summit in, in uh, San Francisco uh, with, with President Biden. Um, uh, so, uh, geopolitics, uh, decoupling. Um, the global south, uh, let me also quarrel a bit with this one. Um, uh, I, I don't think this is a very useful concept, and it's one that has a, a kind of ideology around it. Um, and it, it implies that there's one grouping uh, with the United States and Europe and uh, Japan, uh, and that the rest of the world is in a different kind of area. And uh, both the Chinese and the Indian government have very aggressively advanced the idea of the global south under their leadership. So it's not the same, by the way. Uh, you know, there's a different version of the Global South from India and what the package should be for the Global South from India than it is from China. Um, but they both have, have views of the Global South. Uh, but that, that really uh, isn't the case. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think it was, uh, was wonderful uh, that we had uh, Governor... Kalimbetov, I don't know whether he's, he's still here, um, but he, he was telling us today that um, uh, Kazakhstan is much colder now uh, than uh, Vienna is. Um, so, you, you know, Kazakhs, you know, can you put Kazakhstan in the global south? Of course mm. not. And um, <laughs> of, of course not. Russia, Absolutely. Russia is in the global south. Uh, yeah, Russia is in the exactly. Russia is in the global south. Um, it's absolutely nuts. Um, <laughs> and you know what you get, I think, you know, in this fragmented world is that uh, you will get countries that are worried about regional powers. Um, thinking that they need to use this kind of language in order to balance against their regional power. So uh, Brazil, for instance, uh, under President Lula, uh, likes the idea of the BRICS bank and uh, non-dollar cur currency and, and so on. So it wants to balance against the United States. But if you go to Vietnam, uh, Vietnam is very worried about China and very, very concerned to improve its relations with the United States. Um, uh, Mark had a great conference in Armenia uh, uh, a, f a few months ago. The Reinventing Bretton Woods uh, Committee had a really wonderful conference in Armenia. And we saw when we were at that conference uh, how disappointed Armenia is by the way that it's been treated by Russia and abandoned by Russia, and how actively Armenia is moving towards the United States. Uh, so, you know, this isn't a world of regionalization either. Um, and uh, it's, it's a world in which there's a lot of insecurity, but in which people are going to construct uh, new alliances. But the global connections uh, are really still there and still important. Um, and uh, finally, um, l let me say industrial policy, because we had a lot of that this morning, um, and whether we're moving to a world of new industrial policy. Um, uh, 
you know, I, I remember this debate, actually, and this is, I'm sorry, you know, this is the kind of thing historians always say. Uh, we've seen it all before. Uh, but, you know, this is another one that I've seen before. Uh, because in the 1980s, uh, I came to the United States in the 1980s, um, everybody was terrified about the rise of Japan. And there were books on the coming war with Japan. There was a bestseller, The Coming War with Japan. And uh, m m one of my colleagues told me, uh, you know, uh, Japan has got a unique method that it's going to secure world dominance. It's going to uh, invade the markets and sell goods under their price and uh, you know, make sure that it captures one market after another. And so very much the same thing as we heard that uh, China uh, is alleged to be doing uh, with uh, solar panels. Well, what's the result of that? Um, I, I said, well, you know, in the long run, you can't do that. If you keep on doing that, you'll go bankrupt and uh, you'll, you'll get into a mess. Um, and I think exactly that, that uh, you know, what you do when you do industrial policy on this kind of scale uh, is that you just uh, store up the kind of problems uh, that we've already heard uh, that uh, China ha has. Uh, so, um, you know, I'm sorry to be negative, but um, four terms, geopolitics, decoupling, uh, the global south, and uh, industrial policy, four terms that I think are really pretty poisonous terms and we shouldn't be using. Thanks. Well, this is certainly thought-provoking, and I hope a lot of thought was provoked. Um, let's go to Massimiliano. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, and of course, thanks to Mark for the invitation. I would like to do a little bit of history. You will forgive me if I, I'm not an historian, but I think we, it's, it's worth to look a little bit to the longer term, just rather than the last one or two years to understand where we are. And I would like to ask you three questions, basically. First of all, is deglobalization really happening? Because that's also something uh, which I think is, uh, we can debate. Uh, in particular, is deglobalization happening now? Or is it something which has roots, longer roots, going back uh, in time? Uh, the second question is about financial globalization. You will forgive me, I work in a bank. So probably we look at financial globalization a little bit closer than anything else. And the, four, and the third one is about the role of the dollar, because that's also a topic which is always plugged into this debate about fragmentation and what does it mean for the global financial architecture. So uh, the first question, is the globalization already happening? Uh, my answer, in short, is uh, not yet. If uh, by deglobalization we mean that the world is moving uh, towards uh, a sort of a long-term path, of falling a movement of labor, capital, and trade. But for sure something happened. And it didn't happen actually with, in the last two years. It didn't happen with the war in Ukraine. It didn't happen with, uh, uh, with, uh, with the most recent event with COVID. I think these were probably just catalysts acting on something which is actually coming from the great financial crisis. If you look at international trade, it's a very simple graph you will see that since 2008, international trade basically remained more or less as constant as a share of GDP. So this was a big change because we were coming from the period of uh, hyper-globalization when international trade was rising faster than GDP. So basically the intensity of, of trade as a, total, as, a, as a percentage of the total pie produced in the world was rising. So this, uh, this stopped. And the question then is, uh, why did it stop in uh, 2008? I will come back on financial globalization, which of course was impacted directly by the great financial crisis. But uh, I believe that there are uh, more deep uh, roots. First of all, uh, probably the big effect of the inclusion of China into WTO and the collapse of the Soviet Union in some way fade away. We have 1989, it lasted basically at the very strong, intense pace for about 25 years. That's a pretty long period of time. So it was in some way physiological that the globalization slowed down. And uh, of course, the, what really changed is the political around it. I mean, uh, Professor mentioned Trump, Brexit. There is no doubt that 2016 was the start of protectionism in international trade with Trump. But we should not all forget that 
<coughs> this also was started by China itself. China, uh, the idea of uh, producing more in-house, becoming more independent, actually came before Trump. So I don't want to say that Trump was a reaction to China, because I don't, I'm not sure about that. But for sure, China was already switching to this different economic growth model quite, uh, quite a while ago. So my f the first question, are we deglobalizing? My, my view is that uh, we enter a period of uh, change in globalization. And for sure, what happens in politics will determine whether this uh, evolution in globalization will switch from, uh, the economists call it this globalization. Uh, I, I don't know how we can call it, but let's say a different type of globalization. I think politics has the potential to, to push it. Uh, if, for instance, and I, I believe that the economic performance will be the factor that will determine that. If we're going to have a, a deep recession in the US, if Europe uh, slow down significantly, unemployment rates go up, it is very likely that the, the backlash against globalization will be reinvigorated. There will be much more uh, political capital put uh, on this topic, particularly by populists. So this could have the potential. We're talking about new barriers. We're talking about more protectionism, which I think has the potential to really start when we start to see maybe international trade not only remaining uh, flat, is a purchase in the GDP, but eventually going down, which I think uh, that's what I would define deglobalization. Uh, de Second question is about the financial globalization. Here again, the great financial crisis is actually the turning point. I mean, here we are in Austria. <clears throat> if you look at uh, the uh, level of uh, financial integration within uh, the, euro, the euro area, it actually all started uh, with the great financial crisis. And this was largely about uh, intermediation of banks. Banks with the Basel III and with the fact that the world has changed as a result of the great financial crisis actually reduced their cross-border presence globally. The cross-border uh, uh, lending actually fell. And the, what is interesting is part of this fell has been compensated by over uh, capital movements, uh, portfolio flows, and also foreign direct investment actually compensated but not enough to keep the overall uh, level of uh, uh, cross-border movement of capital at the same level that we had at the peak before the great financial crisis. Then there are the sanctions, of course. The sanction arrived uh, against the Central Bank of Russia. Uh, it was something uh, not uh, unprecedented. We had the sanction before. Iran Central Bank was a case. It was an African country. But for sure, the Central Bank of uh, Russia, given also the standing of this institution globally in the world of central banks, captured the, really the, the attention of, uh, of over the central banks around the world. Now, the question is, did this really have an impact on, uh, uh, on financial globalization? Well, uh, that's something uh, I, I want to see yet, in the sense that there is a lot of talking about sanctions, for sure it had a lot of complexity to financial intermediaries who have to deal with a lot of regulatory and compliance issues. But overall, if you bar out the fact that there are no flows into Russia, of course, in reality, there is a, I haven't seen a dramatic shift. Another example I can give, I work mainly with central banks around the world from an investment perspective. Of course, there is a lot of attention on sanctions, but the question is, have sanctions changed the way central banks see reserve? Has, uh, sanc have sanctions changed the composition of global effects reserve? The simple answer is no. It's not yet. I'm not saying that it will not happen, but so far this has not materialized. What uh, is actually being uh, put a lot of attention of recent, really in the last few weeks, has been uh, the, the slowdown that we are seeing in China in terms of FDI. I can give you for certain that from an investment perspective, since COVID and since the locking measure in China, there has been a slowdown in China in terms of portfolio flows for sure. <clears throat> but the question is, first of all, are these uh, slowdown in portfolio flow due to the geopolitical situation or are more due to the fact that there are legitimate questions being asked about China why China is not recovering as the other Western economies did once they lifted the, uh, the restriction? Is there a deeper problem in China in terms of growth? Could things get worse into China? 
in terms, for instance, that this real estate sector uh, meltdown will eventually expand, really pushing China into not the four and a half or five percent growth rate that many, including the IMF, forecast at the moment, but actually much lower, which for them would feel like a recession. I believe these factors, more cyclical about China, are at the moment the one which are uh, uh, in some way preventing investors from taking position in China. I can also mention, once again, making the example of central banks, that many central banks have started uh, reverted these rising trends of the RMB as a reserve currency. But the question is why? I believe it's not about geopolitics. I think it is largely about financial factors. Until uh, the Federal Reserve started rising interest rates, there was a 2% differential in favor of China in investing in Chinese bonds. This uh, differential reverted. Now we have a 2% in favor of the US when you buy, for instance, US Treasury. Now, if you're an investor, and in particular, if you are an investor who is concerned about capital protection, you really wonder, why should I put my money into an asset which at the moment is yielding much less, and where at the same time there are some uh, serious concern about uh, its growth path in the future, and I could also put as another, uh, the geopolitical factor as well on top of that. So uh, the question about the FDI is very interesting. You know, data is always uh, something complicated in China. If you look at the balance of payment of China, it looks like there has been a 90% drop in FDI. So uh, big FDI article, corporates are running out of China, FDI have been cut. Is it correct? I'm not sure. If you look at other data which came out of China, for instance, for the Minister of Commerce, this drop of 90% is reduced to something like 30%, which is still very bad, but could also fit the situation that we are seeing in China, could also fit the typical volatility of FDI data, which, by the way, are very also sometimes a very, very, very a gray area. So I would not yet uh, say that uh, this drop in FDI that we are seeing in 2023 is uh, the sort of the first sign that we are seeing corporates withdrawing from China in mass. The third element uh, that I ask myself is about the role of US dollar. Here it's interesting because there is this view that uh, the world is moving away from the dollar. If you read the Financial Times, if you read LinkedIn, if you, read, you, you will find hundreds of articles saying that the world is moving away from the dollar. The central banks don't want dollar anymore because they are afraid of sanction. Apart from that, if you don't want dollar, you also don't want euro because the sanctions are exactly the same in terms of how they impact euro or US dollar. But I think here there is more uh, wishful thinking than reality again. Because if you look at the currency composition of reserves, actually the dollar has been on a declining path already for three decades. It was more than 60, it was almost 65% at the peak. It came down to less than 60% now. But this is hardly a sort of a demise of the dollar. This is just the fact the world has changed. I think it is also natural. There is more trade with China. It's pretty natural that uh, um, investors and corporates and also sovereign use a little bit more of this currency compared to the dollar. But if you look at the dollar role, it's actually very strong. And actually, I have a contrarian view. I believe that if we go into a world of geopolitical volatility, I believe that actually the dollar could benefit. It could rise rather than fall. Because if you are a, a sort of, a, I don't like this term, a non-aligned country, which is basically not pro-China and not pro-US. There is this now nice group, they put everything together. It's like the South. <laughs> but uh, in reality, and you live in a dangerous world in terms of geopolitics, conflicts, tension, where do you want to put your money? You want to put your money where you are pretty sure, first, that you are going to keep the value of that, of that asset, something that the US dollar has basically always done, and secondly, that you will be free to pull it out. Because, of course, if you have to choose between China and the US from just this purely capital protection perspective, you really wonder, if I put my money in China and tomorrow China invades Taiwan and there are sanctions against China, Am I able to pull the money out? So I think that's uh, very interesting and very important to keep in mind. Then we have uh, 
What I notice, what I see in the also conversation that I have from central banks uh, from emerging market, there is a genuine demand for less dollar dependency because they see the limitation, right? They see the negative of this. They see, because of course it is a good asset, it's very deep financial markets, I can protect my capital, but it means also that you are dependent on the Fed monetary policy. When interest rates go up, you have an issue. When the US dollar strengthens, you have an issue if you are issuing a lot of stuff in dollar. But in reality, if you look at the different initiatives so far, they no, none has succeed. The BRICS uh, plus uh, currency was uh, an invention uh, of uh, politician which has no ground in reality. It's, it's, a, it's, a no, it's a no go. It will never work. We just think about how difficult it is in Europe, which is a more cohesive region to run a common currency. Think if you have a common currency between uh, Brazil, South Africa, Saudi Arabia, India. And so this genuine demand for currency diversification away from the dollar, I think is being met mainly by creating more uh, linkages between emerging market central banks, more swap lines with the PBOC. But fundamentally, they say the pillar of the uh, US dollar centric system is still there. Final point, uh, because uh, that's also very important and also links to the geopolitics. There is always this view that you read in the press, Saudi Arabia is invoicing oil exported into China into RMB. The reality is that if you think about it, the currency peg, and this is, uh, I speak as an economist, if you have a, a currency peg with the dollar, you will not switch away from dollar invoicing because it would not make sense from an economic, from a macroeconomic stability point of view. So I would say that when I will hear Saudi Arabia or the UAE saying from tomorrow we are depegging from the dollar, maybe we switch to a basket where the RMB is 40% or 35%, whatever, then probably this would tell me that there is a genuine move away from the dollar as an international currency. Another example, and I, and I conclude, for a few weeks ago, uh, Mark was in Hong Kong for the, third, for the anniversary of the uh, Hong Kong dollar peg to the dollar. Now, Hong Kong, whatever is the regime, is part of China. If China wants to, do, to accelerate the switch away from the, from the dollar, the first things I would do, I would depeg the Hong Kong dollar from the dollar to signal that I don't want anymore the dollar to play the role. So, uh, to conclude, in these three questions. I, don't, I think as, uh, globalization has definitely slowed down. I don't think we are deglobalizing yet, but there is the potential for politics to make that happen, if particularly think about 2024, Trump, uh, etc. I think if there will be a recession, which is not our central scenario at the moment, but it could well be that there, there is a, a serious recession across uh, the Western world, I think this could lead to an acceleration in protection, in et cetera. In terms of financial globalization, it's actually holding up, despite all the events that we went through. There is a question mark about what's happening in China, which I think only time uh, will tell us. And we are still in a US dollar-centric global financial system. And I don't think this, this is likely to change anytime soon. And when I mean anytime soon, I mean in the next few years. Thank you very much, Ariel. Um, thanks also to Ambassador Blix, to Mark, uh, to your team as well for the very kind invitation for being here today. Also to the students who are here, um, had a fantastic interview with them down in the basement uh, about half an hour ago. So it was very interesting to engage uh, with, with the student community here. Um, I would like to talk to you today a little bit about sanctions. And before I start, I just want to have a show of hands from you. Who has heard that the US has a 2023 de-risking strategy? Okay, not many people. And the irony is it's a different de-risking to what we're talking about here today, just to confuse you. So I'll try and shed a little bit of light on, on what these two different de-riskings are and how they're actually quite interconnected. So it's, it's quite a confusing um, use of terminologies. So I've been working on the topic of sanctions for 20 years. I actually began my PhD at the University of Oxford where I looked at Cuba, US sanctions on Cuba. 
And I actually wrote a paper at the time which I think had the word glocalization in it, thinking about the fact that the isolation that was created um, when the USSR collapsed, but then also the intensification of US sanctions against Cuba led to a whole load of domestic changes and innovations as a consequence of its global isolation. Um, so th that's uh, nice, nice to see um, discussing these topics again, but in a, in a very different world. I've also worked as a diplomat, and over the last 10 years or so, I've been working very closely with the governments and organizations that make use of sanctions, particularly United States, European Union, United Kingdom, and so on, to try to find ways of mitigating and minimizing some of the fragmentation on global trade and global finance that we're seeing rising as a consequence of global sanctions, especially in relation to humanitarian impacts. So I'll share a little bit with that with you today, if I may. What we see is that We've had now 20 years of targeted sanctions. So back at the late 1990s, early 2000s, we saw the creation of targeted sanctions because of the humanitarian outcry that came about because of the sanctions that were in place against Iraq, Cuba, former Yugoslavia, Haiti, and so on. And these typically were asset freezes, travel bans, arms embargoes that were designed to minimize um, the impacts of these measures against ordinary civilians, but also on their general economies and so on. Um, what we've seen today is a proliferation, of course, in the use of sanctions, and it really has become the tool of choice, the instrument of foreign and security policy for many around the world. Um, but an interesting thing that we're seeing is a stabilization or almost an impasse of adoption on sanctions at the UN Security Council. This is, of course, the fora where sanctions um, were being adopted originally in a multilateral fora. But because of difficulties agreeing on new sanctions regimes at the UN Security Council between the P5 members, we're seeing this proliferation of sanctions outside of the UN context, sometimes in addition to UN measures, but often very much um, separately. And there are a growing number of countries making use of sanctions. We have the usual, um, the usual suspects, of course, which would be the United States, EU, UK, Canada, and so on, but often working in close collaboration with a range of other states and also other regional organizations. So what we're seeing is a kind of, somebody raised the term minilateralism earlier, we're seeing this kind of minilateral or ad hoc governance on sanctions now, often involving some 30 to 40 countries outside of the UN context. And you could call this plurilateral if we um, adopt the term from the World Trade Organization. Um, most of the countries that are making use of sanctions are, um, is it okay to use the term Western or from um, the, the richest economies in the world? And I very much share your views on the term of Global South, incidentally, but it, very much from the richer countries in the world. Having said that, in spite of the fact that China, Russia, other countries around the world have long opposed the use of autonomous sanctions, we're actually seeing those countries starting to make use of their own sanctions with increased regularity as well. The likes of China and Russia have long used what we might call sanctions by other names for 10, 15 years or more. But of course, China has now adopted its own legislation to allow it to use autonomous sanctions itself and also has something that's equivalent to the, EU, the EU blocking statute, which <coughs> seeks to protect Chinese business inter interests from the extraterritorial reach of US sanctions in particular. Um, we also see this kind of mounting opposition of the use of autonomous sanctions, particularly at the Human Rights Council, with mandates uh, usually being put forward by heavily sanctioned countries, but namely Russia, and then along with China, Iran, Venezuela, Cuba, and so on. And these, man these um, resolutions at the Human Rights Council receive um, overwhelming consensus from all lower and middle income countries around the world. So there really is this pitching in views of sanctions today between different parts of the world, questions of legitimacy, legality, ethics, and so on. And it, it, become, it has become a very heated debate. It's also the subject of a lot of disinformation, a lot of um, um, kind of heated, politicized discussions as well around the world. And first of all, I think it's really important to note that we're seeing a growing complexity. A Massimo already, um, Massimiliano, sorry, forgive me, <laughs> Max, already referred to this. Um, we're seeing a growing complexity in sanctions on a number of levels. 
One is that in the last 10 years, we've seen a move away from the more strictly targeted measures that I mentioned already towards much harder hitting, sweeping sectoral sanctions. It was in 2012 that the EU first adopted central bank sanctions on Syria and Iran, and also against strategically important sectors, oil and gas and so on. And this, over the past decade, has gradually become almost the, um, the blueprint for new sanctions regimes. So we're seeing a growing number of countries, the really high-profile ones, um, including Russia now um, and a number of others, Iran, DPRK, in the US case, Venezuela, where we're seeing increasing parts of a country's economy being targeted in quite substantial ways by sanctions. On top of that, we're seeing a growing number of targets around the world, a growing number of geographies being impacted by sanctions. Also, the types of objectives that are being met by sanctions are growing. So in the past, it was more to do with conflict resolution, um, respect for democracy, peace and security, and so on. But we're seeing a growing number of areas, including in relation to semiconductors and um, strategically important um, technology and so on, being the focus of sanctions as well, um, against Huawei, for example, the Chinese telecommunications firm. So that's another proliferation, if you will. And there are also a growing number of countries around the world starting to use autonomous sanctions, not just China, as I mentioned already, and Russia, but also other countries in the Middle East, in Latin America, in Asia, in Africa, that are starting to make use of their own sanctions and also counterterrorism measures. So we're seeing this growing complexity. Um, a final point to say is that these measures are often overlapping with one another in ways that we don't yet understand. So we can, we can try to assess and measure UN sanctions, for example. Some of my colleagues at the Graduate in Institute in Geneva do so, which is um, brought together in the UN Sanctions app that you might be familiar with. But the, we don't have a way yet of understanding this complex overlap and web of sanctions that we see today in any one country. If we take Syria, for example, um, we see over 40 different actors imposing different types of sanctions all at the same time. And we don't know what the cumulative impact is. Finally, just to add to this very complex environment, we have a load of other regulations that are typically imposed, sometimes in parallel with sanctions, that the banker colleagues here will know will know very well. Um, Anti-money laundering, combating the financing of terrorism, there are counter-terrorism listings that I already mentioned, there can be export controls which apply to dual-use goods um, that can often have um, important applicability for hospital equipment, for excavation machinery, for example, if we think about a response to a natural disaster. Um, it can even extend to laptops and, and generators and so on, so goods that can, the ordinary civilians will often need. We also see criminal laws. Um, somebody this morning mentioned um, uh, foreign investment screening. So we're seeing all these other regulations and, and uh, laws and so on starting to overlap with one and each other. And this makes life really difficult for, for companies, for firms, for private sector actors, for NGOs and so on, even for the UN. So what are the implications of this? This is very much the area that I work on. The first is that we're seeing, I would actually maybe beg to differ with you slightly, that I, I believe we're seeing a growing number of countries that are now either partially or fully excluded from the international financial sector. Um, you gave the, the good example of Russia, which is, is of course still very much integrated and on lots of levels. But some of the countries I work on, on behalf of the European Union or the Swiss government, um, the UN, are completely cut off from the international banking sector. The only way to get money in or out of the country is in, in a suitcase, cash in a suitcase. That includes NGOs, that includes businesses. Um, on, in the case of DPRK, for example, that's the case. Um, in relation to Syria, that I've worked on for a long time regarding humanitarian situation, it's the same. NGOs have to make use of money value transfer systems like Hawala, um, which of course have, have existed way before the financial the international financial sector for, for centuries, but this has become the new mode of um, cash um, programming and it can be very uh, high in risk in terms of security, insurance and so on, um, aid diversion. And so it's not, of course, desirable. It can also lead to financial exclusion within a country, and this is not de desirable as well. I'm, I'm, giving, I'm thinking of examples such as Afghanistan, Somalia, South Sudan, Yemen, um, and, and various other countries elsewhere. Um, when, and this is the de-risking I was talking about. So 
I work at the moment uh, very closely with most of the major banks around the world, as well as NGOs and governments, trying to find a way to stem this decline in banking, in financial access issues for various countries. And banks, as I'm sure our banker colleagues would be able to clarify as well, it's not just because of the sanctions or the regulatory um, environment, which is very complex. It's partly also due to cost considerations, I'd say, in questions of profitability, reputational concerns, and so on. I'll give the example of a study I did recently for UNDP and the World Bank on Afghanistan. In talking to one European bank, they said, in order to make a transaction for an NGO into Afghanistan to serve a humanitarian project, there needed to be 50 members of banking staff to check that one transaction. So you can see, what, why would you do that when you're a commercial entity? It's, it's very, very difficult for these organizations to justify staying in certain countries. Um, and there are many examples like that around the world. Um, we also see overcompliance in supply chains, in supply chains of essential goods. Um, in, a, in a project we did recently in Geneva at the Graduate Institute over three years, interviewing private sector actors that uh, were engaged in supply chains of medicines, medical devices, vaccines, and food to heavily sanctioned countries, we saw examples of overcompliance in every conceivable part of the supply chain insurance, shipping, transportation, hardware, software, um, medical devices, pharmaceutical companies, you name it, they, they were afraid of falling foul of the sanctions or just the bureaucratic burden, the costs, the need for legal counsel and so on. And so these companies are also withdrawing from many of these countries. And as a consequence, we're seeing a growing number of countries that are cut off from many essential services banking pathways, um, access to essential goods, normal trade, and the sending of um, remittances, which is also an incredibly e um, important economic lifeline. Um, for anybody that comes from a poorer country, my father's Argentinian. Most of his salary was sent home to his family when I was young. You'll know that remittances serve as incredibly important lifelines to, to countries that are suffering from economic stress. But this de-risking issue that I'm talking about is also a big barrier for remittances as well. So the United States created this uh, 2023 de-risking strategy, not, nothing to do with what we're talking about here today, but instead thinking what can the US government do to stem this worrying decline of financial access to many countries around the world, um, working in close collaboration with the other countries that are using sanctions, the EU, UK, and so on. Um, we're also seeing the discussions about the rise of alternative payment systems, BRICS banks, alternative to SWIFT, and so on. But I agree with you that I think it's not really gaining momentum. But in certain cases, it's perhaps uh, becoming um, a necessity when, when other options are not on the table. We also see, um, drawing, drawing to my conclusion, we also see that this this financial exclusion and being cut off from the financial sector can serve as a vicious circle because we know that financial exclusion of a country, of a community, can lead as a driver to new conflicts, to violent extremism, to human rights abuses such as modern slavery and human trafficking, um, gender inequality, poverty, and so on. Migration. Migration as well. It serves as a driver for migration. So it's absolutely vital that this vicious circle which is sanctions and other regulations designed to tackle some of these issues, then have led to such a complexity that they're then serving as a driver for those issues again. So it's, there's a recognition now in the governments that this vicious circle needs to be cut. We also see that these, these problems of overcompliance and the de-risking that I work on can serve as uh, to diminish political goodwill. We saw that in the case of Iran with the um, nuclear deal that was forged at the UN, the joint, joint, joint Comprehensive Plan of Action. After the plan was agreed and the sanctions were lifted, we didn't see the companies going back in because they continue to be fearful of, of, of various you know, com um, compliance-related issues. And this served to diminish the political goodwill in Tehran with the other negotiating parties. So it really can serve as a long-term diplomatic and political risk as well. So very last point is just to say what's being done on this. So the US has its de-risking strategy, um, and I think we're going to have to work out what we do about the fact that we now have these two different, slightly different terms that, that overlap somehow. Um, maybe you guys are going to have to find a new word, I'm afraid, because we've had ours for quite a long time. <laughs> um, we also see the creation of various humanitarian carve-outs at the UN, the US, EU, and so on, which carve out space for 
private sector actors, banks, NGOs, and so on, to, to keep working in some of these highly isolated countries. Um, the EU has its anti-coercion um, instrument that also kind of links into some of these questions as well. And just to say, in my own work, I've reviewed over 40 dialogues and research projects um, on the de-risking issue um, of this, you know, that's been going on for the last 10 years. There are some fantastic um, recommendations, but progress has been very, very slow. And at least from the government size, the situation is getting worse. The IMF, World Bank, Financial Stability Board, uh, Financial Action Task Force, G20, have all described this de-risking issue as a global crisis that needs urgent action. And yet it remains a really niche issue. Um, so one thing that we're doing in Geneva, we've launched um, a forum for innovation in humanitarian payments, trying to work out what role there could be for digital technologies, um, whether it's kind of blockchain-based cryptocurrencies done in a way that um, can, can be kind of ensure the trackable um, sending of funds. We were talking about this over lunch. Um, and we've also brought together in a separate engagement at Wilton Park in the UK, all of the countries and organizations making use of sanctions to try to encourage them to think about the strategic future of sanctions use and how to mitigate and minimize some of these fragmentary drivers that we're seeing today. So if anyone's interested, I'm happy to share details of those. Thank you. Well, that was terrific. Thank you very much. And um So, so thanks for the invite and, and having me. Um, I will shed some light, and I think I shared also some slides on, yeah, a practitioner view on geopolitics, reconfiguration, and globalization. And definitely I will focus a little bit on the topic of Russia and international sanctions, because we are one of the few large-ticket Western banks still operating in Russia, also in Ukraine, and we are observing also a lot of interesting stuff but maybe to guide a little bit the discussion, you see up until 2013 also uh, Russia integrated into the global financial system, like China, these are international banking exposures. Since 2013, Russia already delivered from the global financial system. We all know 2014-15, we had the Crimea topic, the sanctions. You see China is still integrated massively in the global financial system, so to global banking, Russia was a Greece, and taking Hong Kong into account, and I fully share your view, we have over $2,500 billion banking exposure towards China. But we have to watch closely whether China is at some point also de-risking here. So it was a mixture of both. Russia was de-risking, and it's a long-term path. This means all these de-risking talks, it's not about the next one to two years. Russia was maybe also preparing itself for several years in terms of decoupling and de-risking. And we, as a Western bank active in this country, were also not naive in terms of the risks we are running. So here you see the Russia share in the CE business of Western banks, including us and friendly competitors. And you see up until 2012-13, Russia was accounting 20% in our business in Central Eastern Europe. This is an amount of business that can kill you if something goes wrong, if you think about the portfolio context. You see, up until 2020-21, exposures of Western banks in their own, let me say, regional allocation decreased to 10%. This is a risk you can manage commercially. And we are surviving this crisis, even it creates certain challenges, because Surviving a crisis or having a certain resilience is a different thing than exiting the market because we are currently seeing how challenging it is if you are caught in geopolitics to exit the market. And these are very important lessons learned, I think, to the exposures we have in other areas in the European economy to, let me say, geopolitics. So mind the 10% thresholds. And I think in many dimensions, we in Europe are much above this threshold in certain relationships, talking China, certain sectors, and still the market exit is then very challenging once geopolitics hit the fan. Yeah? So, but this is, let me say, what I can talk about this de-risking and decoupling, and it can take seven to 10 years to come from current exposures to where we want to be. Yeah? And let's watch what China is doing. Here is a chart where I think some 
Western policymakers are not happy to see that, yeah? but you see that Russia managed to bring at least 400, 400 billion dollars plus in exports across the crossing line. Had been in higher in 21, 22, yeah? but this is also because of oil prices. But despite one of the tightest sanction regimes in modern history, Russia managed to ship at least this amount of dollars or let me say, goods out of the country. And we don't think this will change dramatically going forward. And there is means Russia has sufficient buffers and we had to learn as Western community that it's pretty hard to sanction a G20 economy, a current account surplus country, and especially in times when we don't have geopolitically shared views or shared values, honestly speaking. And we all know that China, by the way, is also still a current account plus country. So we plotted the world by population, number of countries, and GDP. And we know it's just 60% of world GDP that is sanctioning Russia. So if we talk about US allies, countries that are maybe still sympathizing with the West and USA, and countries without an explicit geopolitical positioning, we should have ended up at 75 to 80% of world GDP sanctioning Russia. We are not there. So there are so many non-aligned countries that are maybe not sharing our view on Russia, or they continue to do business. And those days, there are a lot of countries that have capable banks, capable financial systems, compared to the situation 10, 15, 20 years ago, that's sufficient for the Russian economy to muddle through. We are not talking about the super booming economy here, but it's sufficient to muddle through. And I think this is a very important lesson from all this sanctioning we have seen. And there is a very important lifeline and hedge. And I'm sharing your view globally, the dollar will remain king for a long period of time. But you see what happened in Russia. Prior to the annexation, 80 to 90%, even 98% of currency trading in Moscow was euro and dollar, catering also to foreign trade. And the yellow bar is yuan and renminbi versus ruble or against US dollar. Currently, 50% of all currency trading in Russia is not in the Western financial system anymore. Yes? And you see that China is providing a certain hedge to Russia, this is sufficient to model through. The interesting question would be, who provides China the hedge, if China needs a hedge? Yeah. But I think the lessons learned from the Russian side is, as long as there is the China hedge, most likely you can model through to every Western sanction regime that will be coming. It's a sad message, but I think it speaks more and more for alignment on a global level, let me say, on, on values, and let me say how to tackle certain world problems. So that's all from my side, giving you some insights from this uh, more practical sanction topic. Thanks. I have a quick comment, I have a quick comment um, as someone who is not an economist. I'm uh, a lapsed lawyer political scientist and a practitioner. What is driving the, self the self inflicting wound of behavior? Because if you, take about, if you take our human economic activity and see how much we're losing by less than optimum behavior, and how much more if you push it to the limit how much more we could have done in economic activity. All the self-inflicting behavior from conflict, from um, uh, criminal activity, um, political competition, you name it, it is very, very deep. If you go back 2,000 years in history, you find at least two hegemons competing. Uh, you probably, oh, okay, so the, the classic example is the Peloponnesian Wars and uh, Greece and Sparta destroying each other, essentially, opening themselves to the invasion of the Roman 
uh, Republic and then the rise of the Roman Empire. If you look at um, the Byzantine Empire and the Parthian Empire, they exhausted each other uh, opening um, the, Par the, the Parthian Empire to destruction by the Arab Caliphate and later on the destruction of the Byzantine Empire. This behavior of a hegemon getting locked in to uh, a struggle with an aspirant hegemonic power that, that is rising is going on as long as the hills. And I do not have a simple solution how, short of negotiation and rationalization of our foreign policy practice, we can avoid this trap. Uh, you can call it the Peloponnesian War Trap, you can call it whatever you want, but it's a trap of a power competition that is very, very deep in human psyche. And here in the heart of Europe, I can think of Carl Jung and others in collect collective uh, unconscious that is driving that. But this is beyond the scope of this conversation. Oh, Jacob? Uh, no. Uh, I would like to ask the panel, the panelists, to comment on each other's presentations because they were different. They were broader range. They were focusing yours. We're focusing on, on sanctions and you're very interesting. Uh, we're focusing uh, on uh, Russia, China. I agree with most of you said, Gunther, I'm not a China scholar, but I spent my life uh, watching Russia, very carefully watching on Russian affairs. Um, and from the geopolitical point of view, um, the sanctions that US led that appear to be very impressive, probably some of the harshest sanctions uh, ever um, imposed. I didn't compare it with South Africa. I, I remember the South African sanctions, but I didn't do, do point by point comparison. They did not reach the outcome and the policymakers were warned that they will not reach the outcome that we intended, which is to stop Russian invasion and occupation of Ukraine. And now a whole new discussion is starting how the end game in Ukraine will look. And it doesn't look like Ukrainian victory. So with that, would the panel care to comment on each other's presentations, please? Sure. sure. Um, th th thanks. Um, well, uh, you, you know, I, th I think the uh, R Russia sanctions uh, story is enormously important, but I, th I think it is also uh, widely misunderstood in that clearly there was a failure of deterrence in terms of not deterring what Vladimir Putin did on the 24th of February last year. Um, but since then, I don't believe that you can really say that sanctions have been ineffective. Um, I, I mean, they've been slow in being applied. Uh, but when, at the end of last year, uh, the Europeans stopped buying the, the oil from uh, uh, Russia, um, you really got a dramatic change. And you know, what you're seeing now in this year, uh, from April this year, uh, the Russian ruble has been falling very, very quickly. Um, it's clear that Russia doesn't have access uh, to important uh, strategic materials. Um, if you're dependent for drones on Iran or for munition on North Korea, what you're doing is to get inferior munitions. Um, it's a sign of weakness and a sign of failure uh, on the on the on the Russian part, um, and uh, you know I think uh, we should really be aware of that. And uh, you know I think also uh, that China is very very clearly aware of that. It's very important I think in terms of uh, Gunter's chart on who's still trading with Russia. Um, yes, of course China is trading a great deal with Russia, uh, but China is not sending uh, military weapons to Russia. Uh, so, you know, that's why you get this North Korea and, uh, and Iranian uh, connection. Uh, and uh, the fact that China uh, 
is not doing that, and the fact that China is restraining uh, Russia, as far as we know, I mean, we, we, we're not going to know um, for sure until we see uh, the collapse of the Putin regime and the opening of the archives on this appalling episode. Uh, but uh, as far as we can see, uh, we can think at the moment uh, that China has been a big player in terms of restraining Russia from the nuclear talk. Um, and that actually is still a triumph of the way in which the international system is connected. Uh, so I, 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 I think uh, we have actually a success story. Um, and you know, if you want to go to the broader implications of this, um, you know, what Russia has done is to make a strategic bet uh, that it can last in Ukraine uh, on what it's got and with the inadequate stuff from North Korea and Iran until November 2024. And then the hope is that uh, Donald Trump will come back uh, and that, uh, that there will be a peace that is imposed uh, by uh, Putin's uh, useful idiot in the White House. Uh, so that's the, that's the <laughs> fantasy that Putin has. Um, uh, I'm not sure that this, uh, the Russian Federation can actually last that long. Uh, but uh, so I, I, I don't think we should be so, so pessimistic about the way in which uh, we've been working our sanctions regime. Well, um, I actually had my pessimism serving me very well uh, most of my life. And I would venture here to say that the the Putin, the Russian Federation, the Putin Federation, the Russian Federation will last uh, till November of 24. Uh, we, unfortunately, to me, I was born in Ukraine, so I root uh, for the Ukrainian team. But unfortunately, we will not see uh, any significant territorial concessions by Russia. We'll be lucky if Russia doesn't take the rest of the Black Sea coast all the way to Odessa and all the way to the Moldovan border, and. Um, we see evidence of Chinese components, not Chinese full weapon systems, but Chinese components being used in Russian drones and other uh, military systems. Uh, and I don't agree, having drilled down in the nuclear area, um, that Russia and China, uh, that China is supporting some kind of a global nuclear um, <coughs> non-proliferation or arms control system. Au contraire, Russia is going full speed ahead, dismantling the Cold War US-USSR arms control system. And it's a tragedy and a threat. It's the greatest threat to our existence since the beginning of the Cold War. And moreover, I can tell you that in my last visits to Moscow before COVID, the senior Russian officials and Duma members and others said, quote, we need a Cuban moment with the United States. We need a nuclear crisis that will threaten the United States so much that the, they, they, the Americans, will recognize the importance of the Russian Federation. And I saw Ukraine uh, as a move in that direction. Uh, the crisis, as far as we know, didn't happen. But the red lines that America extended to itself, self-imposed red lines, are obvious, are obvious. We did not supply all the weapons we could to Ukraine for that reason. So I should shut up, stop myself, and let other uh, colleagues to comment, please. Uh, f first of all, I, I like very much the work that Erika is doing because I think on sanction there is a lot of misunderstanding and... Uh, Clarity is, uh, so in banks, the sanction is uh, dealt by lawyers. So uh, I, don't, I don't even see what exactly means. I just see the sort of <laughs> decision which have been taken, like pulling out of certain jurisdiction because of sanction risk or because of reputational risk, whatever. But maybe uh, I, I never thought about the financial exclusion angle, to be honest, because I thought in the end, uh, that's something that I consider as a side effect, right, of sanction. But I didn't know that it was so big, it's such a big topic, so uh, th thanks for that. But I think there are some interesting uh, twists in this sanction. So for me, I, was, uh, I will stick to the financial sector just because that's the area I know better. But for instance, India, when, uh, why India buys oil from Russia? 
it's not because uh, they decided politically that uh, they like uh, the Russian oil, because basically, in, uh, first of all, in India, who is able to manage the import bill for energy normally wins the election, because there are massive subsidies on oil. By buying oil from Russia during the sanction, India was able to save $100 billion. That's exactly, so think about a country like India, which suddenly can save 100 billion, which you can use, for instance, for subsidizing the price uh, at the pump for people of uh, India. So there is a clear uh, sort of uh, people who take advantage. In economics, it used to be called the free rider. We have a free riding situation there. But there are some interesting twists. Then what happened? Russia say, okay, I'm going to sell you oil, but uh, I don't want dollar, because dollar are subject to sanction. And they are, and so they say, Indian, okay, we pay you in rupee, in Indian rupee. So they pay, they give Russian a lot of Indian rupee, and then suddenly the Russians say, hey, what do we do now with the rupee? Shall we buy rupean bonds, denominated bonds? Well, that's, uh, in the end, they went back into the international market and they bought dollar to such an extent that they put the exchange rate, US dollar, rupee, under pressure, because we're talking about billions and billions, which I believe for the European uh, uh, FX market is a substantial amount of money which can move the exchange. So I'm just trying to put things into perspective about the complexity of this situation, which I think is worth to note. How was the lease time for uh, the Q&A? What's the I would have a brief comment also. Yeah. Yeah. So I also like very much some points uh, you raised because I think we have to be aware of that one, that the global financial system, the dollar and the euro, are still king in global finance. And this will be a very important asset in the years to come. If we look at global FDIs, what we call the Western world is still king. Yeah? And we shouldn't play around with this position for smallish gains. There are some ideas about confiscating Russian reserves and all this stuff. I think we don't need this money for Ukraine. If we want Ukraine to be a prosperous country, we should finance that one. Secondly, you asked about how comes that we are ending up in such negative equilibria. I think you have seen it in Russia, you have seen it in China. It's a turn away from the promise that you will have a better life in the future. It's not economic rationality guiding those countries anymore. It's maybe revanchonist policies or nationalist policies. And um, this brings me to the last point. I'm fully with you. We shouldn't underestimate the agenda on the Russian plate. Yeah, it's we shouldn't underestimate the Russian uh, agenda they're having towards Europe creating a new security order in Europe on Russian terms. Yeah, I'll keep it short. Um, I think I'm so interested in what all of you have said, and just to come back to the sanctions point, um, that commenting on your um, presentations, I think there's a, one of the really big problems we see among governments at the moment is a lack of understanding about how sanctions actually work, how they're effective, what types of impacts they have, and that is a problem of not looking at history, not looking at geography. So I think the more we can do that, the better. There's a misconception that very hard-hitting economic damage caused by sanctions brings about some kind of success. 70 years of scholarship and practice have told us that that is not actually the case. And some more mild version of targeted sanctions, it tends to be much more effective. Unfortunately, under the Trump presidency with the maximum pressure campaign, um, this was the very much the modus operandi, and it's starting to be the thinking in Europe as well. We see that very much with the Russia sanctions. And it's kind of driven this voluntary boycott of over a 1,000 firms from Russia um, that you touched on. And we have this very unusual situation where there's this um, Yale University kind of um, register of all the companies that have come out. There's the hall of shame of the companies that are still there. And that's quite powerful, I think, for, for firms to influence what they're doing and I think that's all unprecedented and my fear is that this becomes the modus operandi for the future and will lead to greater fragmentation so I think it's the more thinking we can do strategically about the future and, and learn from the lessons of the past the better. Great. Um, so uh, how much time do we have? 15. Perfect. 15 minutes. Uh, there were hands. Yep. Jacob. I I really like the session very much. Uh, very great uh, expert in, com uh, in complementarity. So uh, my first remark relates to 
What did I learn from Erica's presentation? And the answer is that indeed there is huge proliferation, proliferation of sanctions all over the world, many, 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 many. And if I stopped there, I would have been surprised that uh, they were not yet fully effective. And then I asked myself, why weren't they effective? And the answer was given, they were not effective because there were ways to, to bypass them. So it's not that just Russia succeeded overcoming the sanctions. Those who imposed the sanctions failed in, in, in securing the support. And I think that's very important. The question is, should you start a journey without knowing that all the wings are fully covered? And I think that the, the, the answer is implicit in the question. And the next issue is, so why do we feel that it's still effective and what was the theory? The theory was, I'm looking at the headlines in the financial press, that so many yachts were confiscated, which makes bigger headlines than lines. Because, uh, so okay, what was the theory? The theory was, they are all friends of Putin and they will impact on Putin. This is a very, very convoluted theory of how you affect an influence a dictator. Dictator does not understand the word friends. So do you expect the friends who are uh, not really solid? Um, so where is the price coming from? I, f I feel that maybe we do not see yet the cost to Russia, but uh, the fact that so many foreign companies left and the human capital they left with must have profound long-term implications. But for those who only are concerned with the short term, they don't factor it in, but there is eventually a damage. But the fact is that the damage is there, but the benefits to those who impose it are not there. I like very much uh, the complementarity between uh, Gunter and, uh, and Marx, because basically Gunter said, well, dollar is the king. And Marx explained why. After all, the first time that there was a question about the leadership of the dollar came after uh, the Gaulle spoke about the exorbitant privilege and the idea of maybe one needs to do something about it. But the first time it was felt in the markets was during the Vietnam War with the acceleration of US inflation. And people said, well, we'll start looking for something else. But this was short lived because Europe was able to arrest the inflation before it came up. And the second time was with the euro crisis. And people said, well, this is, the euro will collapse. And when this is over, then we are back to the basic premise that the leading currency will be that one that has the deepest market, good property rights, a legal framework, and those change much faster than those. Those cannot be changed over time. Um, Use this, please. Okay, I'm, I'm actually finished, so the next one will benefit. <laughs> the next one will benefit from this technical innovation. Uh, one last remark about uh, Russia and China was also mentioned. Those are, uh, Russia is extremely important in the sense of geopolitical order and the reason why they are playing a role, not because they are important in the economy of in any measure, but uh, without nuclear it would not have happened. But nuclear, nuclear and size. Size matters. I, it's, it's, maybe. Gigan it's gigantic. Uh, yeah, I understand. But, you know, Kazakhstan is also large. Much smaller. Uh, okay. Uh, then, but the, in a non-comparison way with China. China is size, markets, and everything that we think about China, it is the first or the second largest trading partner of everyone else. Which means an approach that is now strongly endorsed by the US, bipartisan way, that China is the enemy and therefore we cannot and we should not spend resources to try to bridge it, that's bad for the world. The world will not grow without China. And this is really the point. In the old days we said what is good for General Motors is good for America. And what is good for communication between China and the US is good for the world. I agree. Excellent. And we have behind you Vladislav Inazemtsev, who can expand on the Russian issue. Oh, no, cool. no, sorry. Thank you so much for giving me the word. Uh, actually, I would not expand on the Russia issue because I'm Russian and uh, it's uh, too 
huge topic, I would say. Because we are speaking about reconfiguration of globalization, I have just two small questions. First goes to Professor James, uh, because as I understood, you made some parallels between Japan in the 80s, uh, you know, Japan is number one, China now, and whatsoever. So the question is, uh, as I understood, uh, as I know the history, when Japan faltered in 1989, the United States uh, continued to outsource its industrial production then to South Korea, to Taiwan, and then to China. Uh, but these days, it seems that there is a kind of reindustrialization going back to the United States. Is it true or not? And how it can change the globalization processes? And the second question goes to both uh, speakers from the financial side because everyone is now talking about sanctions uh, and it was said about the Basel III and uh, financial crisis of 2008. And my question was, is it possible to understand the specific of global finance these days without the offshore financial centers? And what is their role in changing or challenging globalization of financial sphere? Thank you. Seconds and a minute. <laughs> right. Um, uh, I, I mean, I think that's right. That um, you know, in terms of the changes that have been taking place, uh, and you know, there's been a lot of reference to this. I mean, it's a very famous chart by now. That you know, from about 2014, um, global trade for the first time since the Second World War grew less quickly than global industrial production. So it actually started this relative decline before the, the big political events of 2016. And uh, some part of that uh, is indeed due to technology, uh, which means that you can produce more in dispersed centers. And so it's technology that is, and you, and many people want to have uh, supplies that are nearby. So if you're thinking of an automobile, uh, you need the components coming from close by and you don't want it to be disrupted and, and that was the beneficiary of this dispersed production so I, I, I think that that, that that is a largely correct story but you know one thing that I think is also important in this uh, in this de-risking uh, story is that it's not really de-risking at all I mean de-risking in, in uh, n not uh, not in Erica's sense in the, uh, in the in the sense that we were using it this morning but de-risking in in, in in that sense um, you know, w one of the things is that uh, you know the United States proportionately is buying less from China, although the volume of U.S. trade with China is actually still increasing. And you know, I think that uh, is testimony to the the point that uh, and Jacob just made uh, very, very uh, powerfully. Um, but you know, one of the things that has happened there is a beautiful paper uh, by Laura Alfaro and uh, Davin Chor on that uh, is that. Uh, simply, um, the United States is buying more from Mexico and China, uh, but Mexico and China are buying more from China, and so um, you know, it's, 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 it's still there. And you know, in terms of de-risking, I mean, you know, one of the things that I think anybody notices in Europe is that there's a shortage of uh, some medicines in pharmacies, um, and that is because uh, something like 90% of the uh, basic ingredients come from China still, and you know whether it's generics that come from India, they still get the components from that uh, from from uh, the PRC. Well, unfortunately, unfortunately, uh, other components are coming from China too. Fentanyl is a huge epidemic in the United States that kills about seventy-five thousand people a year, and all the components for fentanyl come to, from China to the Mexican cartels and then are distributed by the cartels in the United States. Uh, President Biden and Xi Jinping agreed that that will be curbed, and after that, the um, uh, Drug Enforcement Agency agents talked to the Chinese suppliers, and they said they can provide 3,000 tons of these precursors per month, enough to kill every woman men and child in the United States. So sometimes this goes beyond trade, uh, 
the, the financial... So just a note on that. Uh, you know, w w one of the things that some people in China were saying, uh, I mean, not the people at the top of the government, but people in the, in the commentariat were saying was that that was exactly what the British did in the 19th century with the opium trade. Yeah, but that, that's going back, that's going back mm -hmm. a while. Uh, can we have the comment from the uh, financial sector, please? Uh, yeah, I mean, f first of all, uh, very briefly, I want to echo what uh, Jacob just said. Uh, and I want to echo that based on the conversation that I have with clients, institutional investors. Most of the question, you, of course, uh, there is inflation, interest rates. But the most important question, I believe, in the mindset of investors at the moment is what happened in China. Because if China, depending on how China will come out of this uh, sort of moment of difficulty, economic difficulties, I mean, I think it will determine a lot for the global economy. So it's impossible in some way to think of China as Russia in the sense that I know that there's not been isolated, but it's enough to take a GDP share over the last 30 years of Russia and in China, you see that Russia is flat, apart from oil, fundamentally. In Ru the importance of China has been rising steadily. So it would be impossible to think uh, of the global economy basically by cutting out China from the global economy. So I think that's also something to keep in mind. About the role of financial center, I don't know. I, I, what I see is they create a little bit uh, of uh, a problem in understanding the data, in the sense that if you really want to look at flows, of uh, financial, financial flows around the world, uh, it becomes a sort of a detective type of work. You have to put together the data from the country where, for instance, we, uk we look at the data coming out of China. A, a typical example is a US Treasury owned by China. You, also, you often hear this refrain that China could use this as a weapon in an eventually geopolitical. And then you start wondering, do we see any sign of China getting rid of uh, US Treasury in preparation, for instance, of sanction, something that Russia did. Now we know that they did it, that they get rid of all the dollar as much as they could. And uh, it's not easy, because you are, go you are going to take the data from the uh, PBOC, or then you will, have, uh, you will see that these uh, Treasury are held via Cayman Islands, and it's very complicated to understand exactly where are going. But I don't know to what extent, uh, from the deglobalization perspective, uh, this financial center really play a role. In the end, these are intermediaries, these fundamentally. So uh, apart from the data issue, I don't really see a big role for financial intermediaries. I think overdrivers are more important. Adubo? I think I think depends how you see it. For instance, for China, the usage of Hong Kong is very vital. Certain things are done there where China wants a certain security and maybe also the West. Um, other things are already done via mainland. So I think we have accepted in the West and other parts of the world that we still have to trade and to do some business. And here, these financial centers play a certain role. Yeah? But on the other hand, I think, for instance, we have seen that one or the other financial center I think Singapore is not exactly one joint the Western sanctions. Yes, so possibly we would also have some options to work more closely with those global financial offshore centers if we want to build a more global consensus. But I think it will be challenging and we shouldn't be naive. We are both accepting that we need such places because we cannot fully decouple. Good, we have uh, um <coughs> three minutes. Um, yep. Who? The young lady. Yes, please. Thank you. Hello. Thank you for taking my question. Um, my question is for Dr. Erica Moret and um, regarding financial inclusion. What do the more targeted sanctions mean for vulnerable group groups like women? who in many low- and middle-income countries make up some of the largest unbanked populations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. A really important question. So the most targeted sanctions, things like asset freezes, travel bans, arms embargoes, should in theory not impact on vulnerable groups. If you, if you take the example of um, many of the sanctions regimes are only targeted at a few individuals or a few 
companies. I think the problem becomes when you start to see much broader measures that impact on entire sectors um, or um, major financial pathways, uh, central banks, SWIFT, and so on, you start to see impacts on ordinary people. And, and to take but, but one example, if you think that inflation can be uh, a consequence of um, sanctions, currency devaluation, and so on, that can lead to uh, increase in the cost of basic goods, decreased purchasing power, and so on. It could be also cuts to social spending. And that's where we see impacts on uh, vulnerable communities, women, children, those on fixed incomes, the elderly, uh, refugees, and so on. So it's, it's, a, it's a very big topic right now that, that those who are using sanctions are, are really trying to address through a number of different initiatives. Uh, that part of the audience was quiet, so the gentleman was very patient over there. <coughs> uh, th th thank you very much. Um, I, I wanted to go to Gunther's presentation because I wasn't quite sure what your point was. Um, are you saying that because sanctions are not effective, we shouldn't be applying them? Or, um, you know, I mean, honestly, I, I, I cannot quite see um, what, what uh, the presentation was about. Um, and also, your data may not be correct because you know you're showing a huge current account surplus um, of Russia and yet uh, we, we've seen a sharp devaluation of the ruble um, and then the European Union is ten times bigger than than Russia surely you know we must have an economic impact if we wanted to the problem is that we are undermining our own sanctions we are seeing exports to Russia declining but we are seeing exports to Kazakhstan to Armenia to Georgia you know um, uh, uh, quintupling um, and, and that's where the problem is um, but is it about you are saying we shouldn't, we shouldn't apply sanctions? No, my point was not to apply sanctions, but uh, just to show that our sanctions would be at least not sufficient to bring Russia <laughs> under severe pressure short to midterm. We are hurting Russia long term. Russia cannot build maybe significant buffers. And if we get the no next global shock or recession, Russia might be challenged. But with this Limited global consensus, and we see it. Yeah? Russia can easily muddle through. Yeah? And I think it was more a policy-driven, uh, let me say, argument here that we can, I don't know, constrain Russia in 6 to 12 months economically. No, it's working not. Yeah? The 60-40 relationship helps Russia to muddle through, and China is a perfect hedge. Yeah? And I just wanted to present this case without saying I'm not a supporter of the sanctions but just how we are doing it currently, it's more or less not constraining Russia. Thank you. Uh, we are actually, uh, but, so the bosses are saying <laughs> that's it. I would love to continue this conversation may maybe over the coffee break. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Okay, so thank you for Marco Zahn and Claire, and uh, thank you for the panelists. Let's give them a hand. <laughs>